Climate change impacts our lives in ways big and small, from floods and drought to communities displaced by rising sea levels. That's why we invited three sustainability experts to demonstrate how we can mitigate and adapt to climate change and take action to deal with its consequences. Cameron Price, with his sustainability background, seeks to implement nature-based solutions and advance ecosystem restoration, while Simone Grasso created the green tech startup Circle to promote circular economy principles and now educates students and professionals on sustainability innovation. Lastly, Valerie Ide specializes in combining business with a circular economy to create sustainable outcomes, driven by the latest science and technology. After their presentations, they kindly took questions from the audience. So before we start the Q&A session, I'd like to thank our speakers again for sharing their valuable knowledge and experience with us. And as I always say, with step by step, drop by drop, we will certainly make a big change for a thriving future. With that being said, uh, we move on to the first question, and which is open to any uh, to our speakers. Anybody can jump in to answer first. Uh, because we are discussing SDG 13 today, one of its targets is uh, uh, or one of its target is to integrate climate change measures into national policy strategies and planning. So in your view, why has it been so difficult for United Nations to make this an absolute reality among all member nations? I might jump in. Yes. I was on the radio, talk radio in Melbourne, talking about the imminent threat of climate change and what the modelling predicts would be the predictable outcome of unmitigated greenhouse gas emissions in 1992 while the Earth Summit was on, so 32 years ago. And so it's not been, it certainly has not been a lack of information, but, and it's also not been a lack of agreement because almost all countries at the official and national level have signed on to the various conventions. And so the question remains, why is it that despite knowing what the threat is, that apart from a blip where there was a reduction during COVID, the, the rate of greenhouse gas emissions has been increasing year on year for the three decades since we've known we've had to turn it around. So what I don't think it is, is individual households and individual people. Yes, people can contribute, but it seems to me to be a systemic problem. The way we set up the economic system post-World War II has entrenched a, a way of controlling the flow of capital so that it's self-protective. And so the system itself is designed to resist the kinds of changes we needed to make. Thank you, Cameron. Anybody else? Yeah, I'm not. I'm. I'm not informed for in a, a United Nations level, but um, as far as uh, you can see in, uh, in Europe, uh, the implementation of, of um, uh, national policies of uh, circular economy strategies on a national level through the leadership of EU is actually going to this uh, direction, uh, because the implementation of this strategy have specific targets uh, in on uh, all the aspects of. Uh, um, of the environmental challenge that we currently face, and uh, therefore the uh, like providing even more uh, strict binding uh, policies with target oriented um, uh, policies, we can actually uh, reach this um, uh, this goal. It's going to be for sure challenging, but it's uh, I see it is the direction Europe is currently going. Um, okay, so in my part, I think that the um, um, sustainable uh, goals that we have were at the beginning set for big company and they didn't reach um, a citizen, okay, because it was hard. First, uh, you have 17 and 17 are not alone because they all mixed together. So it was challenging, I think, for um, at the beginning for the organization to give it to the population. 
And this can come only with education where uh, all company need to have it. For example, I am a hairdresser or I am um, uh, someone who repair cars. Everyone, everyone and every uh, citizen can know what uh, he is doing into the sustainable goal. So I, I think that it was a reaching so population really, and not only the big corporation at the beginning. So it, it, it was just a question of time that this complex uh, explanation can be uh, driving to the, the population. And it's very easy because now with all the organization, NGO and everything, they are starting to give the impact that we have uh, all together in technology. You have a lot of startups that are working to give the impact to uh, to population. So you know when you are taking a train, what kind of uh, impact you are doing and in which uh, SDG you are acting, no? So I think it was just a way to get down to um, step and go more to a citizen. Thank you. Thank you for sharing those views. Um, so uh, I'll start with specific questions. With your permission, I'll start with Valerie. Uh, so my question is, you discussed about the transparency and accountability to build trust in stakeholders. So my question is, do you think in today's world, this can be possible without losing profits, without incurring high costs, which ultimately challenge the existence of the business itself? So if you can share your views. Um, well, yes, I think it's possible because, as I say in my in my presentation, I think that big company today are uh, very at the place to uh, make something change and to make collaboration and cooperation, and that's key. If we don't have a cooperation, we cannot succeed and achieve the the climate change. It's not possible. So we really need to find a solution of doing uh, the things all together. So I think we're going to change uh, also in finance. For example, you have more and more banks that are kicking care, where they're investing, for which topic, with which, which impact. So I think that we are going on, on that way, that today the main uh, important thing that a big uh, a financial company are looking at, it's in what they're investing. And they're investing in trying to make the change happen. So I really believe positive, positively that this is something that we will achieve because it's the only way, by the way, we don't have another planet. So um, I think it's possible with the change business model that we were speaking also in uh, value-based innovation is changing the business model that we have. Today is not okay for consumption, but perhaps for quality, perhaps for uh, the same in health, we will say, why you have to go and to be healed to get uh, some medicine. No, perhaps it's better to value this with prevention, okay? And the same with products. We take care about the prominence of a product that stay like 20 years in the market instead of the volume of sales. So I think we are going on this new trend of doing things and we're going to rebuild uh, quality over quantity and uh, the way of valuating a company also in the way that they're impacting the society, but also the the planet, and that's a way that uh, things are going to change. So yes, I think that uh, finance are going on this way also. Right. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Uh, now coming to Cameron, um, uh, my question to you is because you talked about nature based solutions and mentioned that it has started attracting fundings to solve some of the major challenges. Uh, my question is, how can such solutions help the underdeveloped countries in contributing towards strengthening their economy? If you can share a specific example, that would be great. Thank you. Sure. Well, there's two approaches. One is afforestation, so planting trees. And that has multiple benefits because, especially if it's not done as a monoculture, if it's done with species richness, like diversity, it can contribute towards ecological restoration goals, but also trees can be selected that are also have some utility or function or commercial value for the local community. That could be um, fodder for cattle, there could be nuts or other you know, honey, there can be other non-timber forest products. In terms of climate change, though, while it remains a really key part of the, the strategy. The, the challenge with the use of trees for carbon sequestration is that there's a, a sigmoid graph, the rate of 
um, carbon sequestration is slow initially in the early years. And then it does pick up until it peaks and then eventually as the tree senesces, it drops again. But there's a lag. And so we need action now. So it's not, it needs to be part of the solution, but planting trees alone, while necessary, is insufficient. The most critical thing is avoiding deforestation. And so there's funding rec mechanisms in place like Red Plus that pay developing countries to have practices to avoid deforestation. So that's one of the main things. And the challenge, I mean, it's easy to sit back and judge, but there are reasons, there are dynamics that lead to deforestation and it's largely driven by poverty. So if through international development and economic community driven um, aid can set communities up to have revenue sources, then there'll be less drive for deforestation, which will mean in turn the communities are better off and so is the planet. Thank you. Thank you for your views. Uh, I certainly believe that uh, be it a developed nation or underdeveloped or a developing nation, these are the some practices which any any economy, any country can adopt uh, and it comes very naturally. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, a question is for Simone. Um, you mentioned about that 80% of the products environmental impacts are determined at the design phase. So uh, my question to you is, does circular economy consider the practice of responsible and ethical procurement for all the materials that is being reduced to produce goods and services? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Uh, in, in theory, of course, they need to be put into practice in any specific uh, production process in any specific company. But uh, responsible procurement uh, is absolutely a part of circular economy. Uh, there is a misconception that is uh, just waste uh, management uh, and it's often not to uh, be said enough that circular economy is also how you procure the resources that you need for your uh, for your processes. Uh, of course, part of this will be uh, still uh, virgin materials, but we know that there are many materials already in the cycle that can be reused, uh, that can be remanufactured to uh, sustain our, our demands. So in both cases, uh, uh, we need to have a responsible approach and to measure along the entire uh, supply chain who are the, the players and how do, um, how do they perform on the environmental aspect, but also how do they behave on a social uh, one. So um, there is a, um, um, a lot of literature talking about the green sourcing, green procurement, and um, uh, that also accounts to the, so the social aspect, not just the environmental ones. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'll come back to uh, Valerie. Um, uh, you talked about uh, community participation, how it can bring a big change in uh, specifically in water conservation and sustainability. Another very important aspect uh, is the society, where it is driven by cultural beliefs and the values. In your views, how those beliefs and values shape the attitude of society towards water conservation and sustainability? Or, I mean, the thing is, do you think it acts as a barrier or a bridge? Um, well, I think that now we have a bridge factor because um, when all stakeholders are on the same same way in the same cooperation to go, this brings uh, to uh, give um, the real information and uh, as I was saying before, uh, to the population. Okay. So it is very easy. You can you can take it in a long, in a different way. Imagine we have a city. Okay. And in this city, we want to make communi uh, uh, communities, communities that can do something in uh, a planting tree, others that they want to make something about uh, food waste, uh, others they want to make with this and uh, make like a mushroom and they put it in the ground to make it better for uh, other company. I mean, everything is a question of cooperation, the same that the end. So I really think that the education and the way of how we are approaching the message mm. to community is really key. 
So I think we are leveraging this and uh, uh, more and more you can see it in school where they are speaking about what is climate change as a topic uh, that is into the course, what is circular economy, uh, the same that are doing also NGO and the foundation that they are trying to give this knowledge to people. So I really think that now it's uh, only a question of cooperation be between all the stakeholders. I hope I have an answer to your uh, question. Yes, uh, and uh, I certainly agree to the fact that education is the center pillar for changing the mentality of the community exactly. of the people and at large uh, uh, whole uh, country. Yeah, so, because yeah. Uh, it's not only solving a problem, it's really uh, educating. For example, yes. you see machine to avoid to have plastic in a port and you say, why? That means that we don't make it good because mm. normally to make it good is that there is enough education that nobody is going to throw away a bottle of plastic in the sea that we have to find a solution to take it back. No, we need to give the information, give the impact. And here it's a lot of education with all the shareholders, big company, organization, startup, um, um, NGO, everyone in the same direction to give this knowledge. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing those uh, insights. Uh, my next question uh, would be with uh, to Cameron. Um, Please share your thoughts on what could be the fundamental barriers uh, to adopting nature-based solutions to support, you mentioned about green infrastructure, urban greening in cities, when we know that it can solve many problems related to air and water sustainability. So there are a couple of barriers. At the moment, one of the major funding mechanisms for nature-based solutions is the voluntary carbon markets. And at the moment, these are under scrutiny and there's a lot of controversy because some projects and frameworks have been criticised as being illegitimate and not effectively sequestering much or any carbon at all. And so these have been subject to um, you know, high-profile media reports and, and discussion. This has thrown the, car, the voluntary carbon market into a bit of disarray and has made some funders hesitant. So that's now a barrier. What needs to happen is particularly the, um, the verifiers like Vera and Gold Standard need to assert and affirm their the legitimacy of their accreditation processes so that then investors have the confidence to proceed with purchasing carbon credits, which is at the moment the primary funder. The other thing, the other mechanism is through um, alternative investment instruments like blended finance and green bonds. Now, these are useful, and there's some great examples, but they're only a very, very small proportion of the overall you know, bond market, for example. And one of the challenges, the barriers, is the level of complexity. Now, I'm not sure how to address that, but if the if the, the process of setting up some of these alternative investment instruments like blended finance and and, uh, and green bonds could be streamlined, that could open up significant, you know, billions to trillions um, that could go into fund the level of restoration and climate action that we need to see over the next few years. Uh, thank you. Thank you for sharing the thoughts. Um, I, I'm almost running out of uh, time right now, but again, I'll just try and squeeze one quick question if uh, to Simone and uh, request him to be quickly addressing this question if he can. Um, so during the presentation, you mentioned about um, uh, there was a point that you uh, covered. Italy is uh, looking for reduction in fossil fuel consumption by a third. And I understand this is based on the assessment in Fit 455 policy. So how do you see a country like Italy achieve that target in coming years, considering that there is a lot of geopolitical drama happening 
in current years and we have seen it in recent years. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah, actually, I think it's a, a goal for all um, European member states, uh, but specifically Italy um, uh, is, is currently facing uh, many challenges on uh, uh, energy um, on energy level, even though the um, opportunities for uh, specifically renewables and uh, uh, solar, solar energies. Um, therefore, um, I think that in um, in, uh, in our specific case, uh, um, the uh, cooperation with Europe in developing such a solution on uh, um, in the south of Italy, in Italy, in the Mediterranean Sea, can be um, a great opportunity. There are still many major challenges to to implement it. I understand that, and it's not with only with Italy, but it's like a worldwide problem that everybody is facing right now. Uh, well, we are running short of time, and this this restricts me to ask further questions. But I was really enjoying it. I understand all our listeners and watch, uh, viewers are also enjoying this. But I would request our speakers to answer some of the questions uh, on offline, uh, and for our viewers to please do sign up our newsletter to get access to these Q and A's and latest updates. Thank you. Thank you.